Welcome to Inside Immune Bio. This is Dan Carlson, and I'm with Mark Lodell, who's our Chief Scientific Officer, head of the NK Cell Program here, and the developer of our Ink Immune Therapy. Uh, thanks for joining us, Mark. Uh, thanks for the invitation. Always good to chat. Um, first off, Mark, let's since it's your first call uh, on an immune webinar, what exactly is important about NK cells and why are we targeting them? Okay, well, that's a really good question. Um, firstly, um, there's tons of data out there to show that healthy individuals with good NK cell function are protected from cancer uh, more so than healthy individuals um, who have poor NK cell function. So we know that NK cells are responsible for tumor immune surveillance. They're running around our bodies all the time dealing with those tumors that are popping up all the time. And it's only when either the NK cells fail or the tumor derives a way or evolves a way of evading NK killing that you end up with cancer. And the other reason is that the very first adoptive immunotherapy trials in the world uh, conducted in the US in the late 19, uh, mid 1980s were NK cell immunotherapy trials and they were very promising. The challenges were that no one could make the doses of NK cells that were needed uh, to, to get the effects that uh, Steve Rosenberg showed at the NIH. And that's been the, the sort of the story forever, uh, which is why we're working with a system to activate the patient's own NK cells. So we don't have to manufacture billions of NK cells in the lab in order to treat patients, uh, which has been the sort of uh, the, the routine and remains the routine uh, uh, mechanism of using NK cells uh, currently in the world. Mark, I, I keep hearing about memory-like NK cells, and this appears to be what our, our goal is to achieve. Can you talk about what exactly is a memory-like NK cell? That's also a pretty good question. So back in, 19, in 2003, 2004, in my lab in London, we started to notice that when NK cells inter interact with a tumor cell or some tumor cells, they obtain the ability to kill other tumor cells better. So you can imagine that mostly when an NK cell comes across a tumor cell, it kills it and then it's exhausted. It's like running the 100 meters. You run 100 meters, you've got to wait a bit before you run the next 100 meters. And NK cells are a bit like that. But what we showed was that sometimes when an NK cell interacts with some tumor cells, and that's where immune came from, the NK cell doesn't get exhausted. It actually gets switched on and allows it to kill other tumor cells better. And we called that memory. Um, and then in 2009 and, and subsequently, other groups around the world have discovered very, very similar findings and called them memory-like NK cells. Uh, and that's really where the world is. We know that you can make NK cells um, uh, which have this memory-like function and they kill better. And as we've shown in our recent paper, they have other characteristics which make them very attractive therapeutically. Um, but it must be emphasized, these are normal cells. You and I have them in our blood all the time. What we're doing here is, is enhancing them or, or allowing the body to make more of them. So you mentioned this recent paper, which, um, which is very important uh, data that you published. Can you talk about where the data came from that you, that you published? Yeah, so um, this is a, an interesting paper, A, because it's in a a well-respected high-impact journal has been refereed by experts in the field, um, which makes it very credible. But the interesting thing is that many, the, all of the, it contains data both from in vitro laboratory experiments, where we've taken blood from patients and from healthy donors, and uniquely also from patients who've been treated with Inkmune. And so we're able to see what Inkmune does in the patient and how those cells that are generated by Inkmune compare to memory-like NK cells that we've made in the lab, and then compared them with memory-like NK cells made with cytokines that other groups are working on around the world and shown that they are the same. So, so that, that's really the, the, the sort of the big take-home message from that. We've been able to work on um, NK cells made in the lab, as well as um, those that have ari arisen in patients following treatment with Inkmune. And, and, and what were the significant findings from your paper? Well, um, there are lots of them. Um, we've hypothesized, well, firstly, we know that um, from lots of in vitro data before that we've published, that NK cells that are primed with Inkmune uh, have the ability to kill multiple NK resistant tumors. And we've taken that just a bit further in, in this um, paper. We've also expanded the number of, of patient um, samples that we've tested. So we've looked at patients with different 
uh, cancers and shown that they can respond to immune in the lab. Um, we've also demonstrated that the uh, patients, as I say, who are treated with immune generate those cells and those cells become extremely potent um, and, ma and maintain their potency for a very long time. And I guess finally, you know, we know from previous data that we've published that NK cells that are prime with immune perform very well in um, hypoxia, which is, is the, the lack of oxygen that you see in the middle of a tumor, um, and in the presence of immunosuppressive um, immune cells that switch NK cells off in the tumor. And what we've found here is we, we've hypothesized that um, uh, immune primed NK cells are not affected by that tumor microenvironment. And in this paper, we've demonstrated scientifically what molecular changes occur in the NK cell that actually pre prepare them for the tumor microenvironment better. So we know that NK cells and tumor microenvironment aren't very mitochondrially fit. And it's mitochondria that keep us all alive. Every cell in your body is being driven by this engine that's called a mitochondria. And NK cells in tumors don't have very good mitochondrial function. We've shown that Incommune upregulates mitochondria in these cells, and it's one of the mechanisms by which NK cells will survive better in the tumor microenvironment, which is brilliant now that we're moving into, uh, or we have moved into treating patients with solid tumors where the tumor microenvironment is, is, is such a, a hurdle for most immunotherapeutic products. So you say that NK cells have, are not doing well in the tumor microenvironment. Most of uh, the trials that are run on NK cells away from immune are on healthy donor cells. Um, you're working with cancer patients. Does this work on those NK cells in that's, cancer patients? Absolutely. And that's what's so exciting. And that's why we were really pleased to get this paper published. We've looked at cells from patients with breast cancer, ovarian cancer, um, the hematological malignancies over the last 25 years. Um, and this paper continues that. We've looked at patients with prostate cancer, um, uh, well, not, in, not, not in this publication, but we've looked at, at, at patients with other solid tumors in this paper. And um, all of them respond in the same way. And they, they have the same protein changes that, that uh, NK cells from healthy donors have. So yes, we, that, that's um, part of the, the excitement around this. Um, we've got more evidence that um, uh, we can generate tumor primed NK cells with memory-like function in patients with cancer. You also mentioned that it works on multiple cancer types um, and that you didn't use prostate in this paper, but your first target is prostate. Um, so maybe you can talk about why you chose prostate and, and where we stand in that trial. Okay. So um, in this, uh, <clears throat> when one's doing this sort of research that we've published, you're dependent upon access to clinical material from patients. Uh, and that requires um, a considerable amount of effort. It seems very simple. You just go to a patient and say, can I have a blood sample? In fact, it requires um, application for a clinical trial just to take blood samples. You have to have an ethics approval nationally. It's, it's a very great, um, uh, great step just to get some in vitro data. So we've worked in this paper with um, patient material that we already had ethical committee approval to, to, to collect and patient consent forms and all the rest of it. Um, in terms of the clinical trial, the reason we went for prostate is, is several fold. One, there's a lot of data in the literature to show that NK cells, um, the patients with good NK cell function have better outcome, and fewer of them get metastatic disease. So um, what you can hypothesize from that is that NK cells are protecting the patients from metastasis. So if you have a patient with metastatic disease, the hypothesis is that their NK cells aren't functioning very well. So if you can find a way of activating their NK cells without causing side effects, then potentially you've got a way of treating metastatic disease. So that's, that's the scientific rationale behind it or the clinical rationale. But most importantly, early phase clinical trials require real patient buy-in because these patients have, have got a terminal disease. They've, got, they've been told they don't have very long to live. So to spend some of your time going into hospital to be treated is actually a huge commitment. And it was the clinicians that came to us, prostate cancer doctors, and said, we really think we'd like you to do a trial in prostate. And that's really important because now you've got um, a clinical advocate who's talking to his or her patients and inspiring them to, to, to commit time uh, to a clinical trial. And it's paid off. We are really, really on track, absolutely perfectly, 
for patient treatment in this trial, which I've never seen that happen in a phase one trial in immunotherapy in 35 years of doing academic and commercial clinical trials. You never see perfect enrollment. We currently have patients queued up who want to be treated in this trial, which is remarkable. So that's why prostate is such a great um, target. We know immunologically it's a good target. We've got data looking at um, NK killing of prostate tumor cell lines, one of which is in this paper. Um, and we have complete buy-in from the patients and the clinicians who are really excited about the trial. So yeah, it's, it's, it's a, a home run from my perspective. That's great to hear about enrollment. Um, where do you stand in terms of dosing and when will investors have a chance to see if there's some results from the trial? That's a good good question. So the trial is, is as all with a phase one trial, regulatory agencies like the FDA are very conservative in what they'll let you do. Um, so we are uh, doing a dose escalation trial, as, as you will know, with three patients treated at the lowest dose, three patients treated at the intermediate dose, and three patients treated at the highest dose. We've already completed all patient treatments at the um, uh, lowest dose. We have just treated the second patient uh, in the middle co cohort, and we're on track to complete that cohort in August. And the exciting thing there is that when we open the third high dose cohort, um, which we fully expect to have completely enrolled um, by the end of the year, when we open that third cohort, we are allowed to treat up to six patients simultaneously at the intermediate level cohort because we, we will have shown it's safe. So we have enough drug already manufactured to, to, to do all of this. So as soon as we've treated the second patient in our, our um, third co in our second cohort, we're able to start screening patients for that extended uh, cohort. So we will have all of the nine patients enrolled and analyzed by the end of the year. And we will we are analyzing data on these patients all the time. The first clinical data are now uh, independently being assessed uh, in terms of tumor load, and we will start to look at those data um, as they are, are released to us. Uh, so yes, as we get exciting data, we will be talking about them um, when we're convinced that they are absolutely nailed down, true validated data, because the last thing I want to do uh, in any setting is, is to over egg the, the pudding. We want to make certain that when we come out to the investors and tell them what we're doing, we are absolutely certain of those data. And uh, well, that's that's what my lab in London is doing at the moment. We're analyzing samples all the time. Um, and uh, we're waiting for, for the clinical results to come back from our clinical colleagues in, in the States. Mark, would you consider Incmune to be a cell therapy? Because mo most of these um, NK programs are similar to like a CAR T program where it's cell therapy, which which brings into questions uh, manufacturing, cost, yeah. transportability, et cetera. How would you qualify uh, Incmune in that regard? So from a regulatory perspective, from, from what the FDA and all the other regulatory agencies um, uh, think, uh, Incmune is quite rightly a cell medicine. I hate the term cell therapy because it makes it sound like it's a, a, a a near patient, you know, experience. Um, transplant as blood cell transplant or bone marrow transplant is a cell therapy. Um, these uh, CAR T cells, CAR NK cells, adoptive NK cells are all cellular medicines and they are regulated as such. Uh, so Incmune is a cellular medicine like a CAR T. The difference is that this is a completely off the shelf, not patient specific, and indeed, as you've just said, not even tumor specific um, therapy. So or medicine. So this is a drug. It's regulated as a drug. Uh, it's regulated as a biologic drug in, in the US, but it's off the shelf. And because I've been doing this a long time, I know how many of these uh, cellular medicines have failed. And uh, that many of that is because you can't deliver it in, in the clinical setting you need to get to. Ink means very different. We have from get go designed it to be manufactured at very large scale. So we are at moderate scale at the moment, but it's a completely scalable manufacturing process. We have, uh, from get-go, validated the storage of this and the transport of this at temperatures that are used by routine drugs. So whereas a CAR-T has to be shipped in vapor phase nitrogen in a specialist shipper, ours is shipped on dry ice like a vaccine. Um, it goes into the same freezers that COVID vaccines go into, and every hospital in the world now has a million of those. Um, and we can deliver it in a very timely fashion to the hospitals 
and it goes into a routine process that hospital pharmacists are familiar with. So the unique thing about Inkmune is that it is a cellular medicine and it is the first ever cellular medicine to be in trial in non-specialist uh, tertiary centers. So the, our first patient to be treated in, in um, uh, the VA system will be next week. And um, that is, is, is unique to us. You know, we, we, no other cellular medicine has been allowed to be given in an outpatient setting uh, outside of a tertiary uh, center with a bone marrow transplant program. So yeah, we have a drug that's cheap to manufacture, easy to ship, easy to administer, um, and it's, it's clinicians who are using it and their nursing staff just, just love the way it, it's administered. So, so yeah, we, we've got this buttoned up uh, and it's, it's, although it is a cell medicine, it's completely different to anything else. All right, Mark. Well, sounds, uh, sounds great. I mean, we have a drug that's uh, easy to transport, uh, cheap to manufacture. You've worked out the manufacturing process already and, uh, and we're in trials. So we'll have some results uh, hopefully later this year start seeing if we if we have a successful drug in our hands. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm, I'm very excited um, about the solid tumor world and uh, we will we will press ahead. We're already looking at our next solid tumor target. Awesome. I look forward to learning what that is and um, perhaps we'll do a follow up call after we get some results. So thank you for your time today. Great. Thanks for setting this up. Take care.